The typical middle to upper middle class household occupies more than 2,000 square feet of floor space, owns at least two cars, a couple of couches, numerous chairs, beds and tables, a washer and dryer, more than two televisions, a VCR and has cable. The kitchen contains a conventional oven, a microwave, a frost-free refrigerator, a blender, a coffee maker, a tea kettle, a food processor, and so many pots, pans, dishes, cups, glasses, storage containers, kitchen utensils, and pieces of flatware that they aren't even counted. Elsewhere in this house are a personal computer and a printer, telephones, an answering machine, a calculator, a stereo or CD player, musical instruments, and many pieces of art. In addition to paintings and reproductions, there are decorative items such as vases, plates, and statuettes, photographs in frames, and knickknacks. In the bathroom are a hair dryer, a scale, perhaps an electric toothbrush or shaver, and cabinets overflowing with towels, shampoos, conditioners, face creams, and other cosmetics. The closets are stuffed with clothes and shoes of all types, dressed suits, pants, shirts, sweaters, coats, hats, boots, sneakers, flats, pumps, walking shoes, patent leathers, and loafers. And don't forget the jewelry. In addition to watches, the diamond ring, and other high-value items, there's usually a large collection of costume jewelry, bead necklaces, bracelets, and earrings, earrings, earrings. The family room is filled with books, videos, tapes, CDs, magazines, and more photos and knickknacks. The floors are covered with rugs or carpet, and throughout the house are scattered other pieces of furniture, accented perhaps with dried or silk flowers, stored in the garage or base is all the sports equipment, such as bicycles and skis, as well as luggages and totes, lawn and garden tools. In addition to all these durable products, households spend heavily on services such as childcare, movies, restaurants and bars, hotel stays, airplane trips, haircuts, massages, visits to Disney World, lawyer bills, insurance premiums, interest payments, and sometimes rental on the storage space where even more stuff resides. If you are a typical consumer, you did not always have so much. There was probably a time in your adult life when you could fit everything you owned into your car and drive off into the sunset. Now you need professionals to transport your possessions. If I find something that I really love, I've got to have it. <laughs> if that's materialistic, yes. yes. Americans are, in Americans. fact, too materialistic. <laughs> Is that a joke question? Now, wait a minute, just a minute. What's wrong with this type of materialism? I think many of us in our society, our consumer society, are so distracted, so alienated, so fragmented by the whole consumption process that we um, are not sure if we've actually been alive. Feeling alive in this country has come to be a counterfeit feeling and that we think that when we buy something, we have an excitement and we think we're feeling alive. The problem is, is that the moment doesn't last because it's brought on by particular circumstances. So then you have to shop again. On one level, the Industrial Revolution transformed the very nature of work, replacing the slow, deliberate age of craftsmanship with the planned frenzy of the factory. Genes, inventions, power, black out the past, forget the quiet cities, bring in the steam and steel, the iron men, the giants, open the throttles faster and faster. But on another level, as the sheer speed and efficiency of the new age exploded into unprecedented levels of productivity, something more fundamental was in the process of being transformed. The very way people saw themselves and their place in the world. In the process, revolutionizing not only how much stuff we were able to produce for others, but how much we would be able to acquire for ourselves. Right before the century turned, we had the roaring 90s. were a period like the 1920s and the 1980s and 90s, which was a period, a lot of wealth being made, a lot of wealth being concentrated at the top. So the distribution got more and more unequal. So in American culture, the first person that really looked carefully at over-the-top consumption was this uh, wonderful curmudgeon, cantankerous character named Thorsten Veblen. Thorsten Veblen wrote his classic theory, The Leisure Class, and that was a partly satirical but very serious look at the growing role of using products to convey social status and to create social superiority. 
you know, obviously took a dislike to ostentation and wealth, saw it as a, you know, a violation of the type of values that he thought the country should be expressing. And for the first time, he really laid out the importance of consumption as a way of defining self that you would consume, as he said, conspicuously, because you wanted somebody else to see exactly who you were. American culture does, after World War II, take a profound shift. I wish I had a castle in the sky where we could watch the world go by with silver. As people who had always yearned to be part of the consumerist mentality were allowed in. And they were allowed in both because they had the disposable time and the disposable money. And also because the suppliers of objects, cars, refrigerators, all kinds of things that had been difficult to get to, now we're streaming this stuff at ever cheaper prices into a eager community of consumers. Hurry, 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 hurry. The world is so full of a number of things and we don't want to miss any. And so you had more and more people from the working class being incorporated into a middle class lifestyle, being able to own homes, move to the suburbs and so forth. The idea of keeping up with the Joneses arises in that context. And the idea is that the Joneses live you know, in the house next door in the subdivision. And you're watching them as they accumulate Chevy, washing machine, television. Keeping up with the Joneses means trying to keep up with a rising standard of living, looking at people you know, people you live among, so it's a neighborhood-based model. I think the other important part about that model in contrast to today is that it was a model of face-to-face -face social interaction. People wanted things not because the advertisers told them they needed to have them, but because their neighbor had it and they saw the Chevy drive into the driveway. People saw the new clothing or the stuff for the kids or whatever it was and they saw it and wanted it and it was a really a model of social comparison. In the 70s, you start to see things changing. A couple of big changes. One is the number of women going into the workforce, working for pay increases, particularly among married women, married with children. They shift out of that more egalitarian neighborhood context into corporations, which are very hierarchical. And so they're exposed to people of higher economic levels, their boss, their boss's boss, and so forth. And then the other key thing is that instead of a situation in which people all up and down the economic distribution are pretty much just looking to others who are like them, more and more people start to gaze toward the top the so-called affluent lifestyle. Now that happens for a couple of reasons. One is that those people are becoming very conspicuous in the way they're consuming. They're getting into the newspapers and the magazines. Some of the most famous examples of this start in the 1980s, Dallas and Dynasty. Soap operas, which had always over-represented the wealthy, come into prime time and are seen by many, many more people. This is the era where you have the show, The Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, which eventually you know, morphs into MTV's Cribs and then Home and Garden TV. And as people watch more and more media, they're no longer seeing what's happening with their neighbors because they're increasingly don't even know their neighbors or new kinds of houses got built where people drive right into the house when they come home and they don't have to go outside. So the decline of social interaction at the neighborhood level becomes very important. And it's a process like what Veblen was talking about in the 1890s. Really, really conspicuous consumption. Enter the age of modern advertising. Consumption may have been conspicuous, but appeals to our consumer desires would become even more so giving rise to a glistening new world of images and messages and brands. 
a world of surface appeals targeted at deep human needs by a new class of experts charged with awakening our inner urge to shop. For those of us who have enough, we are no longer stimulated by our cravings and our scarcity to consume more. So now, in order to make us consume more, we are subjected to a lot of propaganda. Oh my God, everything is advertising. We're being run by our subconscious drives. And as long as we're being run by our subconscious drives, then those who are conscious of those drives can manipulate them and control them. And so then it's really just lining up the barnyard animals and farmers find that if you play soothing music, the cows give better milk. So you get mall music everywhere. just become phenomenally sophisticated over the last 40 or 50 years is in very large part running the whole consumer culture. On every billboard, radio and television, on every newspaper and magazine. And it's frightening because they've gotten so good at reaching in and finding what motivates, you know, the macho man or the even beautiful woman but who wants to be more beautiful or the uncomfortable teenager. Like, they know how to go straight to our our fears. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this commercial is going to use subliminal, subliminal, subliminal advertising. In a very strange way, I think our society is, is being subjected to a kind of mind control. That means you will never see or hear the name of the product. It's very much to me like the movie The Matrix. Sales, they've got to go up. We have to step back out of The Matrix and learn how to make choices for ourselves. My brain burns with it. They've switched. It used to be, you know, if you buy this, then you'll be popular. And now it's buy this and you will be happy. Make your holiday wishes come true. They're very, very clever. And no, I think it's a particularly towards kids. I think it's enormously unfair to take some of the best trained minds in cognitive psychology, to take the, some of the best trained technicians uh, working with computer animations and graphics, put those together into short segments of 30 seconds or so that tell people, well, here's who you are and here's what's important. Let's not forget the young people. In my last book, Born to Buy, I did a survey of kids. This is a group, the market is called tweens. They're marketed to very, very intensely. What my survey found is that involvement in consumer culture undermines kids' well-being in a variety of ways, that the kids who are less exposed, those kids are better off. They're healthier. They have a better sense of self. Give those kids something for their busy little minds, I always say. I used a statistical model that allows us to ask the question, is it poor parenting that leads to consumer involvement? But what's interesting today is that the good parents and the bad parents have super consumer involved kids. We're spending 20 times as much to target kids with advertising today as we were in 1980. This is paying off. And the tactics, which include trying to make parents look like idiots and fuddy-duddies, this, this sort of stuff, to promote aggressive and rude behavior because it's cool and will sell a product. I've heard marketers say antisocial behavior, behavior in pursuit of a product is a good thing. Sweden doesn't allow advertising to kids under 12. Neither does the province of Quebec, and neither should we. 
If your children are growing up in a culture in which what everybody is doing is involving themselves in consumer culture, it's very difficult to isolate them from that. I think Madison Avenue has an enormous amount of power in our lives. It's been said that to control a society, you don't need to control its courts, you don't need to control its armies. All you need to do is control its stories, and it's television and Madison Avenue that's telling us most of the stories, most of the time, to most of the people. It's interesting, I think a, a number of folks, myself included, uh, get to a certain point where it's really invisible. And I think, in a sense, because it's so all-pervasive, the advertisers have created that scenario themselves. You know, they've bombarded us with messages to the point where we just don't listen anymore and honestly don't care. So I don't really have the anger around it, um, but I know some people do. Because it's subliminal, right? Subliminal. They're like walking around and there's all sorts of posters and banners and stuff that you don't even recognize, you don't even see. We just bought a car, and I believe that the advertising was a, a big part of that. I've got some big news. The average person sees about 25,000 commercials on television a year. And every commercial is not simply a pitch for a product, it's a pitch for a set of values, an attitude towards life. If you realize that the human being is hardwired to respond emotionally to stories. You can now understand why applying stories to things is so important. So if you have a widget that comes out of a widget machine, and here's another widget from another widget machine, if I can tell you a story about this one that separates this one from that one, I can actually get you to feel differently. And feeling is what we're after. Very often luxury objects are objects that are only separated because of the way they're able to make us feel, oh, now I've got it. Got what? Got overpriced water? Got an overpriced car? You put the logic machine on top of it, it makes no sense. But you put the emotional machine next to it, you can see what's happening. Human beings are very unusual in that they have a large enough brain and a capacity to be able to see beyond the immediate instinctual striving, which is what drives most animals. The part of the brain that grew is our frontal lobes, which are the intelligent, rational part of the brain. So on the one hand, we're instinctually driven, but on the other side, we have this incredible intelligence which allows us to either harness the instinctual stuff or to be harnessed by it. From a neuroscience standpoint, this is predicated upon the very well worked out and understood process by which the brain pays attention to the environment, and it's called the reward system, and it's driven by a set of chemistries which are called the dopamine chemistries. There are many ways in which this reward system can be hijacked. The most obvious are things like cocaine, amphetamines, caffeine. I like coffee. But those systems, once they are hijacked, they essentially take over all the rational part of thinking. I mean, they're very valuable in keeping us safe and telling us what's good and bad in the world, but the danger is that they get caught up in the reward cycle, which is meaningless. I like ice cream, I like potato chips, but I know that if I were to eat ice cream and potato chips all day long, I would probably turn out to be weighing 250 pounds, which probably would not be good for me. It used to be restricted because there was no ice cream and there were no potato chips. But now, in our affluent society, we have all these things. We have to consciously say to ourselves, how much of this do I need? You know, more of this is not enough. You need something beyond ice cream and chips. So it's complicated, but it's not difficult to understand. It's a balance between rational behavior and instinctual behavior. The instinctual behavior is what's, what drives the reward system. And the rational behavior is what makes you human. Let's just think about the context in which we're living. We 
are continuously looking for new things. So that the consumer marketplace never stays still. And in fact, things are accelerating. So everybody wants a new cell phone, even though the old one's working perfectly. You want one with a flip up top or the one that's silver or red or, you know, has more buttons on it. Everything has to be stainless steel. I can't live without anything stainless steel. And I got all kinds of play twice. I like to walk through big super centers just as like a test of will, you know? I'll, I'll go down and I'll just be like, oh, that looks delicious. No. Coffee maker, espresso machine. And I got a Bentley and a Lante and it's red. My one thing is I like coach purses. Okay, that would be fine in some ways if it were sustainable in a financial sense or in an ecological sense. Because the system is always moving. Your identity with any one set of products is always changing. But the basic rationale behind wanting the stuff is very fundamentally rooted in deep social dynamics around inequality, competition, social esteem, and so forth. Because our system says that you gain esteem through what you have and how you show it. Consumption is about social communication and social connection. The problem isn't that consumption is social. That's a good thing. The problem is that we are socially communicating, connecting in very perverse and dysfunctional ways. The rise of consumer society has long raised serious concerns about declines in democratic participation and citizenship. Whatever the virtues of consumption, they have not always sat well with the basic demand in democratic societies for people who know what's going on in the world and aren't afraid to participate in it. John Dewey on his 90th birthday said, democracy is born in conversation. And it's talking to each other about it and getting a chance to think. And if we have this lifestyle that has no time, that's filled up with advertising all the time, or working long hours, or driving in your car, you know, we have to run around to do things. We can't walk, we can't ride a bike. The barriers that have now allowed us to essentially work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, have been, they've been removed. You know, the time is no longer an issue, space is no longer an issue, distance is no longer an issue. Uh, we can just work all the time. What you find is that there's a rising level of anxiety in the country because everybody's continuously competing, worrying that somehow somebody's going to get ahead of them. You know, I ask people when I go and speak to people at, at workplaces, and I say, you know, do you feel some hope? Can you do something about your lack of time? And they say, no. And I always think, how can this have happened? The most powerful country in the world, and its people feel powerless to change? So the affluence drives us into sickness because we can't figure out what to do with it. We haven't spent enough time thinking about it. We've spent a lot of time thinking about how to survive when there isn't much around to eat or when it's dangerous, etc., etc. But we haven't spent any time thinking about what to do with affluence. Armageddon Come and get it 